Well, I am a dairy farmer at heart, but as a dairy farmer, I knew that I would never make a living by selling milk. And so long ago, I decided I wanted to be a cheesemaker because I wanted to do something with this really fabulous milk. I'm as passionate about raw milk dairy products as I am about grazing and being 100% grass fed. These are things I believe in very, very strongly. I think milk is a really great food and I hate to adulterate it too much. So that's why we make raw milk cheeses. But also my cheese making style sort of reflects that and that I don't want to get in the way of the milk too terribly much. I want the milk to actually express itself in the cheese. We make three to five types of cheese at this farm. We make two hard cheeses. They're Pyrenean style. One is a tome. And so that's just a very simple rustic shepherd's cheese. That's the easiest cheese to make. It's aged anywhere from four months to a year. We make a washed curd cheese. That's called folie. And so that's also an aged cheese. I age that one six to 12 months, generally. That's a nuttier hard cheese. Our most popular cheeses are blue cheese, and that's a Roquefort style blue, so it's got a penicillium Roqueforti culture in it. That's an unpressed cheese. But I age that anywhere from six to 12 months as well. And I occasionally make a pecorino style cheese. That's an Italian style hard cheese, aged anywhere from eight months to two years. And then our newer cheese is called Cardon Bear, and that's a Cardoon coagulated cheese. It's also an aged cheese, but it's much younger cheese. That's sold at two months of age. It's a softer cheese. Because I'm a farmer and work with animals, I'm very aware of the fact that my hands go through all kinds of different things. So during the cheese making process, I wash my hands constantly. I'm sort of a hand washing fanatic. Our cheese vat is a commercial soup kettle, a used commercial soup kettle. It's a 40 gallon vat. It's uh, double jacketed, so there's water between two layers of stainless steel. You can hook it up to a boiler to heat that jacket, but we use just a, a propane ring underneath. I typically process as much milk as I can in a batch of cheese. The largest batches I make are about 35 gallons of milk. The other day I made about 30 gallons of milk into cheese and I made about 42 pounds of cheese. The sheep milk is even richer very late in the season and your yield goes up. But sheep milk is a high yielding milk. I'll make six or seven cheeses in a batch. It's really, really small, very, very handmade. I tend to treat my milk very gently. I don't heat it terribly much. I don't stir it terribly much. I don't press it terribly much. I just really try not to stand in the way of the milk flavor too much. I'm very careful when I'm putting the cold milk in my vat to not pour it too vigorously so that the fat globules stay intact. I use a pH meter to check the pH of my milk at the start so I know what I'm starting with and I'm checking the pH throughout the cheese making process and I'm looking at the acid development of the cheese and I'm basing some of my steps on that depending on how fast or how slow acid is developing in the cheese making so this little pH meter is very handy. I tend to heat the milk very gently I'm not stirring it a whole lot. I don't want to, again, disturb the milk too much and break fat globules. I do use, for most of our cheeses, a bacterial culture. And I use a culture just based on the type of cheese I'm trying to make. Depending on the kind of cheese I make, I'm heating the milk to a particular degree. It really depends on the recipe. I let the culture ripen for an hour in my vat. I don't rush the process too terribly much. And then I'm coagulating it. We use an organic microbial rennet to coagulate our milk. Although I like 
animal rennet from a traditional cheese making standpoint and that's rennet that was derived from the stomach of lambs or kids or calves. When I think about what the industry must look like to create that rennet, I don't like what I think it must be. So that's why I'm using this microbial rennet because it's organic. I know it's non-GMO. It's a fungus. It is very good in aged cheeses. Some non-animal rennets impart a bitter flavor to cheese, aged cheese. The microbial rennet doesn't. It's a very nice rennet. Works really well for us. I'm assessing when to cut the curd. I'm looking for a clean break in the curd, um, and that I do by feel. And now, here we go. I'm cutting the curd, and the size of the curd is dependent on the kind of cheese I'm making. And again, I'm trying to be gentle. I cut the curd with a large pastry spatula, I think it's called. It depends on what kind of cheese you're making, but basically the whey is starting to be expelled from the curd. Whenever I make cheese, I make very detailed notes of what I did. What was the condition of the milk? What was the condition of the weather? Was my dairy really cold, really warm? I want to know what I did, and then later on when I open those cheeses, I'll make notes based on how they came out. And so that's just a way to, to number one, dial in your process, but number two, keep track of what you've got, you know, in terms of a marketing standpoint as well. So taking notes is really, really important. I'm gently starting to stir or warm that curd, depending on the recipe that I'm using. And I'm getting some of the curd off the sides of the vat, and I'm starting to very, very gently stir that curd. It's still really fragile at this point, and I don't want to unduly force the whey out of the curd. I want the, the whey to be expelled naturally through the course of the cut surfaces on the curd. I don't want to squish it out, so I'm very gently stirring the curd. After I've stirred the curd and I've got it to the consistency that I'm looking for, and that's dependent on the recipe as well, I'm going to let the curd pitch, and that is I'm going to let it sink down through the whey. Depending on the acidity in the whey at that point, I'm either going to let it sit for a while or I'm going to start putting it in the hoops immediately if the acidity is dropping quite quickly. I gently pour the whey off the curd. And then scoop the curd by hand into my molds. And I'm trying to make each mold about the same size. Once I distribute all the curd in the molds, then I'm going to start pressing the cheese. We have off-the-wall presses here on a stainless steel table, and my husband built and designed those presses. I press the cheese gently at first. I don't want to, again, overstress the curd and overexpel the whey, so I just start pressing gently. And I'll turn the cheeses after about a half hour or an hour, and I can put more weight on them at that time and expel more whey. And I generally leave them in the press for one to two days and turning them frequently throughout the process. We built a straw bale house on the farm and we built it with a full basement and the basement was designed to be our cheese cave. It's below grade, it's cinder block construction. 
It has airflow ducts, inflow and outflow ducts in it that we wanted air exchange in that cheese cave. And we wanted it to be naturally cooled, but we found after a couple of years of use that late in the summer, it was just getting a little too warm in the cheese cave when we did have to add a artificial cooling unit that we have to use during the middle of the summer to keep it cool. I tend to keep the cave about 55 degrees in the summertime. In the wintertime when we turn off all the cooling and we don't have additional heat down there, it'll get down to 40, 45, but that's fine. You know, the cheeses have their own arc of seasons, <laughs> so I don't mind that. I do try and keep the humidity high down there, 80 to 85 percent, and I do that by pouring buckets of water on the floor. My brine baths are in the cheese cave, so this is where the cheeses get salted. Having the brine bath in the cheese cave keeps the brine cooler, which is more sanitary and helps it keep a higher quality. I check the pH of the brine bath on occasion, and I brine the cheeses. Depends on which cheese I'm making for a particular set rate, and I'll turn them in the brine halfway through their brining time. The cheeses age on these hardwood shelves. They're turned regularly. Some cheesemakers actually stamp batch numbers or dates or something in their cheeses. I don't. My batches of cheese on the aging shelves are tied to their batch number, and then I record that when I'm marketing those cheeses. So I don't have the individual cheese marked, but I have the shelf where they're aging marked. The younger cheeses get far more attention than the older cheeses. The cheeses get fairly stable after they've developed their rind, but there is certainly more work uh, a cheesemaker could do down here, and I tend to um, leave the cheeses to their own devices more than I probably should. <laughs> Cheese making, it's in some ways very simple, in other ways extremely complex, and you can learn it your whole life. But the flavor of our milk still really comes through, and that's really neat to see. Our milk really shines through those cheeses.